Hello and welcome to another episode of The Lowdown. Today I am absolutely delighted to be joined by the world-renowned throwing coach Thomas Granamark. Although best known for his work at Liverpool, Thomas has also consulted clubs such as Ajax, FC Midtjylland, Genk and Red Bull Leipzig. In addition to his work at the professional level of football, Thomas also holds the Guinness World Record for the world's longest throw. Thomas, welcome to the show. Thanks a lot, Connor. Thomas, just to begin, I suppose the big question on everybody's mind is how and where did you cultivate this passion for throwing? Yeah, first of all, uh, you, we have to go all the way back to the mid 80s and I was yeah, approximately 10 years old, born in 75. So um, I watched my big cousins um, play football and then yeah, you probably know if you have big cousins or brothers or someone uncles or so family members you look up to you're really thinking hey they're totally cool and and two of my big cousins who played football they they had a really good long throw in so i was really fascinated by their long throw in and and i started doing that myself as as a football player uh, it soon became my speciality i had like two super strengths in football the first thing was a really good throw in and then i was really fast too i never uh, lost a a running duel in, in a football game in my life, so so always been natural fast. When we came to the mid nineties, um, then I realized I couldn't be a professional football player, even though I've been played in the highest Danish U nineteen league. Also played against uh, great players, for example uh, Thomas Graveson a lot of times, who later played for Celtic or Real Madrid. But um, I thought I had to change sports, so. Um, I went to athletics and already the first year I was training, I came on the Danish national team and I was doing athletics for um, six years and all six years on the Danish national team. I was several time Danish champion also in year 2000, I was a uh, European uh, champion together with my teammates. So we won the European championship uh, for clubs in the four by 400 meter relay in 2000 in Paris. So pretty all the uh, athletics years was successful, but in 2002, yeah, if you looked at the results, I've never been better, but um, yeah, I needed some change in my life because I've been moving to the western part of Denmark because I met my wife and suddenly I was training alone. So these good results were just like, like numbers on a paper suddenly. So I realized I had to change back to a team sport because I love playing football and, and being together with a lot of people. So um, I found uh, bobsleighing, and uh, at that time there was a new, newly started Danish bobsleigh team. Um, uh, so in 2002, I, I came on the Danish national bobsleigh team, and I was traveling all around the world with this bobsleigh team, the whole Europe, but also the States, Canada, and so. And it was in the middle of that bobsleigh period in 2004. Um, we had this like cooperation with the German National Federation. So uh, before a training, we just played some indoor football just for fun for a warm up. And I made a long throw in and I thought, hey, uh, if I can make a good throw in myself, can't I teach other players to do it? So after that bobsleigh trip in 2004, I, in January there, I, I went down to my local library and tried to find that book about throw-ins, but there were no books at all. And I looked at the internet and, and nothing serious. So I decided to make my own throwing course and use approximately six months to, to videotape myself, analyze myself, my own movements. And, and then in the fall 2004, I had a throwing course. Course. But to be honest, I didn't know if it would work on other people because I only tried it on myself. So, yeah, I could have been tr uh, starting with a with a youth team or amateur team, but I had the courage to contact a local Super League team in Denmark. That's the best league, league here, and a team called Vibor, and they they said yes, and yeah, they improved their throw-ins a lot, scored a lot of goals on on throw-ins. The club had its best placement ever in the club's history that season. So all in all, it was success. The year after, it was FC Midtjylland, an even bigger team in Denmark. And yeah, and then I've coached a lot of teams, professional teams on up till uh, 2018. And, and it was here my big breakthrough came when Jurgen Klopp from Liverpool FC called me directly and, and asked me for help. Well, it's quite the background. and. It's just very interesting in terms of the path you took, Thomas. So you left football, you go into athletics, 
then you leave athletics to go into bobsled, then you go back into football. Do you think nowadays having such a multidisciplinary approach, so to speak, would benefit players or would benefit perhaps coaching staff such as yourself re-entering the football space? Yeah, absolutely. You know that um, sports, also team sports, is a lot about coordination, uh, but also knowledge and inspiration. And and for example, we we know where. I don't know if you know the sport handball, but it's very popular in Denmark and also, uh, yeah, especially in Europe too. And I, I heard a talk once with 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 the U U twenty one national coach there, and 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 he said that they found out that. If if a player is only uh, playing one position, then he'll not be as good as 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 if he he or she plays like like three, four, five different positions. And it's not only internal in in the sport itself. It can also be like doing other sports. It helps your coordination. It helps your technique. And of course, you have to specialize in 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 one sport at at one point. But you you know, getting that. Um, inspirational uh, knowledge and, and all the movements from different sports, that's really good. And, and I said here that, that I've been getting inspiration from, from, of course, playing myself, football, athletics, bobsleighing in my throwing coaching job. But I'm also taking a lot from basketball because I've been playing basketball one season myself in a club, but my whole life I've been playing street basketball, watching a lot of basketball. So, so myself, I try to... to um, get inspired by a lot of different things and not only football. So so, so I totally agree with people who are saying that that uh, good football players also have to be able to do other things because then it, it's easier to learn uh, new football stuff too. Of course. And just um, touching on basketball there, really intrigued. And you said, you know, it's one of your more recent influences. What is the difference between the mental routine of a basketball player, let's say, going to the three-point line, as opposed to an Andrew Robertson or a Trent Alexander-Arnold on a European night at Anfield? You know, hectic, two different environments. Is the mental routine somewhat similar or is it drastically different? I think it's pretty much different because you can say that even though it's really hard to um, to put a free throw in in, in a in basketball, you you primarily have to think about getting that ball up in the basket. So it's more about the blocking out all all uh, disturbances uh, from from the audience. I know there's not much uh, many audience now, but but normally, it's also about to uh, to have some 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 really good uh, movements prepared from your training. So so you know that 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 you can like cope with with all the effects from the game and so 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 it's more about controlling your movements there and not much else in in basketball but but in if you have a football throw in then then it's not only yourself and your movements but it's also seeing space being created what what choice should i take uh, what kind of space is good should i throw it fast should i have patience and so so i'll say that um uh, a football throw in much is much more complex than a basketball free throw but but no matter what it's it's you have to uh, be good m mentally to cope with with the, the challenges in in each thing of course and then i listened to you before and um, thomas on dan abraham's podcast the sports side show and you say you have this mantra you live your life by that um there's nothing better than a good story you know you seem to be taking the initiative all throughout your life as evidenced by your work today now how did perceived setbacks in the past, such as you had world record attempts in Copenhagen during the middle of a Denmark-Spain game, and you had a world record attempt at the Olympic Stadium in Berlin, although some, in some circles some people see them as setbacks, failures, how did you overcome those obstacles to get to where you are today? Um, first of all, I'll say it, it, it's, it's a lot about confidence and uh, if you're lacking self-confidence, then it's really uphill. But if you are pretty confident or confident or really confident, you know, I think it's, it's, it's all about, about um, you know, measuring your training, your results. Um, for example, if, if, if you can see it goes upwards in training, it goes better and better. Your technique is better and better. For example, with my flip throw in there. 
uh, then you have confidence and then it's all about how is the weather conditions how did you cope with certain things and 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 you have to remember when i set the world record in it's throw in i was a non-gymnast so it's really so it was really um it was really a big challenge for me so so if i had like let's just say i had 30 flip throw-ins in a training i'll probably from the start have like 29 really bad and then only one bad and then you know it changed and changed and changed so when i had my first world record attempt in 2008 in the national match between denmark and spain i wasn't at a really good level even though i, I if i had been lucky i could actually been uh, you know being the world record there but at that time i i if i again had like 30 attempts in training then i'll perhaps have like like 15 really bad 10 bad then three okay uh, one good and then one really good i think that was 30. um so these numbers change and change and change so are you good at measuring what is important what kind of goals you have uh, then it's easier to cope with with uh, with a challenge or with a setback because some people look at it as setback but actually even though i only threw 44 meters at the first record attempt in in 2008 and still was over four meters from the world record it was actually much better than when i started learning the flip throwing a lot of people didn't know that so 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 but it was like like really an improvement for me then it's also a little bit like goal setting one thing is to measure your performance in training i also think it's setting realistic goals but also set them in in steps and when i had i had a my very first um very first um world rec record attempt was in a no local football match here in my hometown skive in uh, they played in the second league in denmark and i knew i couldn't beat the world record at that time uh, but i also knew that there was a european not official european record but i knew the the european guy who had been throwing the longest i also knew there was an unofficial danish world uh, danish record there so i had this world record on 48.17 then had a european record on 64 something sorry sorry 46 something and then um, then i had an official danish record on on 42 meters so when i did my first record attempt there i knew that there was a good chance of at least beating the the danish record so even though i didn't beat the uh, world record or european record at the first try i beat the danish record so it, it was still like you know a feeling of me going forward so it's also about setting setting uh, goals but also make them small enough to so it's realistic that you can beat them. Of course, you don't have to set them so small that it's it's easy to beat them. So, so I took one uh, one step at the time. You can say that, and then you can say I've learned a lot about setbacks and and challenges, especially when I was a box day driver four years, like crashing a lot of times, uh, coping with first of all mental difficult challenges because bobsleigh sports that's a crazy sport but we also have a gigantic workload with with our work day on 12 14 16 uh, hours per day with um, two times training but also in the in the evening repairing the sled and polishing the runners and so so i've been i've been um, you know dealing with a lot of uh, challenges and for me it's it's a normal thing to have a challenge also we we can talk all day about my challenges here but just a, a thing like if you are an uh, innovator if you're the first to do something like i am as a throwing coach then there'll be a lot of people laughing about you there's been a lot of people laughing about me in in the football world but you know i didn't really care because i had the numbers i had the data i had the experiences and you can say a lot of people laughed at me when it was revealed that i was a throwing coach for liverpool but this has changed um, you know, a lot and we are we are right now at, at the point where even the rival fans of liverpool they, they are often saying uh, it, it, couldn't they hire me and so because their team is, is really bad at the throw. Similar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so um so you know uh, setbacks and challenges and so that's for me that's not not a negative thing it's a it's a part of life no matter if you're going on work at work if you're doing sport or other things in life so for me it's about how can you cope with these challenges how can you make it better sometimes you have to say hey it's not me even though um, even though 
I've reached a lot of things in my life. There's also been things uh, I haven't done yet or said no to. So that's also um, that's also normal. So um, yeah, superb. It's fascinating insight into kind of how you've reframed that obstacle, and you know, sort of speak another. I wouldn't say it's a criticism. Yeah, of course, it could be seen as a criticism being an overnight success. I mean, you're a guy who's left athletics, you've left bobsled, you set up your own throwing course in 2004. Fast forward 17 years later, yeah, of course, you're consulting seven or eight of European football's biggest teams. But during that time also, you've obtained a Guinness World Record. You've done countless other things, which we'll speak about later on. But for me, Thomas, was there one breakthrough moment which catapulted you in front of Europeans, European, the European elite, so to speak. Was there one moment that caught the attention of coaches, of managers? Yeah, I think the the moment where where the attention was caught is was. I think you can take it back to June two thousand eighteen, where a little tweet started everything. Um, uh, in, in June 2018, there was a, a young player called Andreas Paulsen from FC Midtjylland who was sold to Borussemann in Gladbach. I've been coaching Midtjylland for many years and, and uh, Andreas Paulsen, uh, he had improved his throwing for, from uh, 24, 25 meters to 37.90 meters, so almost 14 meters. It's important for me to say uh, long throwings are only a small part of my throwing coaching. but but. But but he was sold for approximately three million euros, three million pounds or so to um, to Bruce and Gladbach, and I was proud of him. So I wrote a tweet: Hey, um, uh, proud of Andreas Paulsen sold to Bruce Mintz and Gladbach, uh, improved his throwing almost fourteen meters. And then there was a small uh, fan media from the Borussia area in Germany and and the Gladbach area there, and. He he asked me, "Hey, can I write an article about you?" And and I said, "Yes, that that's okay. That was cool enough." We, I try to be open-minded upon people who are contacting me. And uh, then there was a, a journalist from the German newspaper, Bild, who saw that article and he called me and said, "Hey, can I make a, an article about you?" And of course, I said yes because Bild is is read by by millions of Germans every day. And the funny thing is that it was exact that article that both Jürgen Klopp but also Ralph Rangnick read. I think Jürgen Klopp it was somewhere in on vacation in Tenerife or so. <laughs> so um, and and that article led to that that Jürgen Klopp called me in in, in early July two thousand eighteen and and yeah of course I was both surprised but also happy. I've, I've always dreamed about coaching the biggest clubs in the world and our also always been sure about I would going to do it in some stage but in 2018 I didn't know if it, if it would be in one year or, or 20 years but I was sure that my knowledge could make a difference so so when Jürgen Klopp called me invited me to Melwood's training camp uh, a training ground uh, Melwood and I had my first meeting my first training already the day after the meeting and, and after that we, we signed a contract and and I think of course, it was big for me that that I was coaching Liverpool FC, uh, but the real change in the world regarding throwing and throwing coaching was when my job in Liverpool was uh, leaked in end of August 2018, and and from that uh, that time, um, you know, it all exploded. Since then, I've been coaching like approximately six, eight. 10 professional teams all around the world per season. Uh, so I'm a freelance throwing coach. And yeah, so the interest has been, uh, been really gigantic. I've been giving around, I think, 300 interviews the last two and a half years or so. So, so it's like, yeah, and it's all from smaller podcasts, but also to New York Times, BBC, Wall Street Journal, Forbes magazine. So, so uh, but it's also because people are... One thing is that they're curious about what are you doing? It's a special job, perhaps the weirdest job in the world. But people are also curious around how can it be that, that football is 140 years old and people haven't really worked with the throw-ins. That's a big mystery. So, but it's only my advantage. So, um, so the big change came in in, in um, July 2018 where your club called me. That's fantastic. And 
I suppose, Thomas, is there any reoccurring themes or common denominators between these environments you're being transposed to, be it Melwood with Jurgen Klopp, Red Bull with Ralph Ragnick, Air Ten Hag at Ajax, FC Midiatland, of course, owned by Matthew Benham. Is there any similarities between those environments, between the culture? Yeah, I think that, that the people are in general really open-minded. A lot of people don't know this, but actually I have a free role in Liverpool FC. I can do what I want because the people trust me. Jurgen Klopp trusts me, and that's the reason why he, he came to me. It was nothing like, hey, uh, can you do approximately like we did last year? No. He trusted that I had the knowledge that I could help the club. So, of course, I'm listening to people. I'm taking in advice and, and coordinating things and things like that. But, you know, in all my clubs, I have like a kind of an own role. So, um, and I think that, that so first of all, people have like a, an open environment where people are helping each other and especially listening. It's not about power. I have to know the most. So really good work environment. And then many places where I work, or I think all places where I work, people, uh, people have an innovative uh, approach to things. And you can say, I think all the team is, I've been working with um, the last, especially the last three, four, five years, they all been winning championships, ending in the top of the leagues, doing great internationally, or if it's been second or third league teams, I think they've all like been been going to the league above after after I've worked with them. So of course it's both because I'm I'm improving the teams, but it's also about work environment being innovative, um, you know, thinking thinking forward. Um, so have forward thinking. So, so um, you know, I'm normally not uh, going to teams if if they think, hey, we do like we did ten years ago or, or twenty years ago. So, um, and I think that's the future because uh, if you look twenty or thirty years back, that was so they only had a the clubs had only a head coach, assistant coach, doctor, physiotherapist, and a goalkeeper coach. That was it. But now, when you're looking at at the clubs now, they they know they have to bring in experts to um, to improve the teams. Sure, and just focusing on that time point in time when you met Jurgen Klopp, the summer of 2018, Liverpool just on the back of losing the Champions League final to Madrid and Kiev. How did you manage to demonstrate the importance of drawing to Jurgen Klopp in his background staff? Oh, I didn't really have to. Um, to prove so much. First of all, the reason why he called me was that Liverpool were actually really, really bad at throw-ins. Later, we found out that in the 17-18 season, before I came, Liverpool had only a possession on 45.4% on throw-ins under pressure, where the players are marked. And Liverpool were only number 18 out of 20 in the Premier League, so third last. So already, your club knew that they had to improve it because it was a really, really big weakness from the team. In my first season, we um, we improved to 68.4% and went from number 18 to number one in the Premier League and also number two in Europe just after one of my other teams have seen Midtjylland. So, so first of all, Jurgen Klopp knew that they were really bad because they had all the data. They, they just did, didn't know how to improve it because they had tried, but it didn't work. So the, reason, the way I did it was, first of all, in the first session, I gave the players the why. I said to them, there are normally between... 40 to 60 throw ins in a match, you are using approximately 50 to 20 minutes in a match on throw ins and throw in related situations with the movement from the players. Then also said most teams they have possession in under 50% of the occasions when have a throw in pressure. And if you have the same possession with your feet, you'll only be playing Sunday league football. And that's the truth. So, um, and, and imagine hearing that and then. Not, after that, you're hearing your manager saying, we, we brought in Thomas. No, he has a special job, but, I, but I'm 100% sure he can, he can help us improve our weakness with the throw-ins. Imagine you're standing there as a player. You've just lost uh, the Champions League final to Real Madrid. You just want to take the last small step to the top of the podium. You've also been number four in the Premier League. You've been waiting 29 years to get that. We are almost there. Of course, as a player, if you're ambitious and you're hearing you have a big weakness, you want to improve that. So I've only been re meeting, you know, motivated players in, in Liverpool. And of course, we took the last step with the Champions League. 
um, winning that in the first season and took the last step after then 30 years of waiting time in last season with the Premier League. Um, so, so I've only been meeting motivated players. Of course, I also have to learn them something. It's not only about talking. So I've worked like I do with my, all my other teams with first the basic throwing things like making the players throw longer, throw more precise, understanding general space creation. Then on top of that, I'm learning them general throwing tools. What kind of typical throwing tools can you use? Then I'm working with the players, individual throwing um, throwing superpowers because some players are good at something. Then I'm working with three different zones, around 50 different throwing tools, and they are all about creating space. Um, and then on top of that, I'm learning the players to use their own fantasy and creativity and imagination. So in theory, there are millions of options when we have a throw-in because it's not like a, a playbook in American football. The players are deciding themselves so it's a little bit like Chiki Taka with Barcelona. They're, they're, not, they're not saying, hey, Messi, run there, and another player, run there, run there. No, they're building it up with small rondos over many years, and suddenly they can do everything. It's the same with my throwing coaching. In general, I'm saying I'm working with the players throwing intelligence. So, um, so that's the way I'm doing it in all flops. So, um, yeah, and I love it. And I suppose a key theme there being getting the players buy-in. Now, how malleable are these world-class superstars to the likes of a Trent Alexander-Arnold, a Mo Salah, uh, G Jordan Henderson? How malleable are they to going back to learning the basics of the game? Because we've seen how that has turned out in the past in the case of Rafael Benitez when he took over Madrid in the 15-16 season, given... Cristiano Ronaldo a DVD teaching how to kick the ball. That didn't work out too well for either party. But anyways, how do you achieve that player buy-in? Is it through presentations, individual analysis sessions? First of all, I, when I'm coaching the players, it's it's of course when I'm on the pitch, I'm I'm doing throwing coaching, of course. And when I'm on the pitch, I'm really trying to um I really try to make the 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 training entertaining too. So when I'm a lot of my training, you also have included passes and scoring on small goals and everything. So I try to do my my throwing thing. Of course, when you have to learn some technical things, you have to you have to like set in time of that because you'll never be better. Then I'm also doing talks for the players and the coaches, and then I'm doing video analysis of the games too. So that's combination of the three parts there. But I think the most important part is, is the work on the pitch. And then I'll also say that, you know, if you're if you're bad at throwing, you sometimes have to, to work with the, with the very basics. And and because if you're not working with the basics, you'll never be better. But I think it's really depending on how you how you put it. Um, you know, to the players and give it to the players. If I'm just giving the players a DVD and say, hey, learn the throw-ins here, of course, they'll be frustrated. So so, so I think it's really important to treat players like human beings, like we all are. So um, so, so we have to, uh, yeah, listen to the players. We have to make them motivated. We have to... Uh, also measure them because that's also a part of of um of motivation that that you can feel your your being better so either for example things like improving your throwing length that's really easy to to measure and most of my players are improving between five and 15 meters just with throwing technique no physical training with with video analysis too of course sometimes like with with possession and uh, keeping possession great and chance to score goals that's a little bit harder to to uh, to measure. But but now with all the data we have now and possibilities for analysis, it's 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 much easier. And then you can also say a sign that it's working is that one of the signs can be that you're winning matches and and things like that. So so yes, but I think one of the most important factors is is player motivation because if you're only coming with a with a piece of paper or a sheet or try to show them, show them something, it's it's much harder to um, to get the improvement. So, yeah. Of course. Fantastic insight. And then, Thomas, 
um, diving deeper, I suppose, into the nitty gritty, the session structure. You've said before, of course, you're a freelancer. You can essentially do what you want, really, at Liverpool. So would it be correct to assume that not every session is a rigid, let's say, match day minus five, we'll do 10 minutes. The next day, match day minus four, we do 10. Uh, the day before the game, we do another 10 minutes. And does it vary from opponent to opponent? Because, of course, you know, you could be coming up against the Leeds United with a heavy American Preston scheme or perhaps a West Bromwich Albion playing at a low block. Will the contents of the session differ from session to session? Oh, it's not really depending on uh, depending on the opponents. Of course, I do. I, I do that in my analysis, you know. Uh, but the training the training on the pitch is not like um, it's it's not depending on the opponent. First of all, I'm not uh, in my clubs every week because if I was that, I couldn't be a freelance throwing coach. But for example, the last two seasons I was visiting Liverpool uh, five times. So it's normally two, three or four training days. And then it's not like like in normal set pieces that you do it before the match. No, often I'm doing it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, for example, the start of the week. And and then I'll also say the way I'm teaching throw-ins and throw-in intelligence, you can like like you said on every opponent, and and I'm coaching everything around the throw-ins you can imagine. Not only attacking throw-ins, but also where the opponents have have a, have a throw-in. So so normally, for example, in Liverpool, we are beating the opponents with with 20, 30, 40 percent in throw-in possessions at throw-ins under pressure. Other games, it's extreme. I can remember a game against Spurs where they had we had nine out of nine throw-ins under pressure possession, 100% possession. And Spurs had four out of 16, 25%. Of course, that was an extreme case there, but it's not unusual that we have these like 20 to 40%. And in 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 some games, it's like making the whole difference. And but if you look over a season, it makes a big difference because. One thing is that you're keeping possession yourself, creating chances, scoring goals after throwing situations all around the pitch. But you're also preventing the opponents from taking the ball from you when you're out of balance. And so it's it's also give less goals for the opponent. So, um, yeah. And can you take it from the opponent too? That's, that can also be a, a, a scoring chance for you. So, um, yeah. Superb. And of course, you've worked with a broad kind of range of spectrum of clubs among Europe's elite. I mean, throughout your years as a throwing coach, was there any particular game, pivotal game or series of games where you were like, yeah, I really do believe my ideas now are firmly crystallized in players' heads? Um, case in point being, last year, Liverpool's title winning campaign, you spoke about the Tottenham game. You've spoken previous podcasts before about the 2-1 victory away to Wolves. Is there any other particular instances? Yeah, there are many more. I think I have in have them in every game. I'll say that, of course, we have a lot of good throw-ins, but in every game there are normally between, I don't know, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight throw-ins where I'm thinking, hey, that's just totally brilliant. It's like if you're sitting in the cinema and seeing a fantastic movie with popcorn, it's just like join my whole body and it can both uh, often it's attacking throw-ins but it can also be defending throw-ins but a lot of these throw-ins people don't see because people are only looking at at at, at where we score after throw-in situations and a lot of these times when we're scoring the people people aren't even realizing that we scored after throw-in situation it's mostly when we score after throwing at the uh, uh, at the opponent's penalty area like against Spurs or Wolves or so the people see it so I have a lot of these um, moments where I think that's just fantastic. But I had that for many years with, with or sorry for the third season here with Liverpool. Um, of course, it's 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 even more extreme when I come. In, I'm I'm coaching a new team because they'll often go from really bad to good or from good to fantastic. And especially in the start, I, I'm seeing this big change. Right now, I'm just getting used to that. We are having good throw-ins in Liverpool, but, but still, I enjoy it. Brilliant. And then, I know outside of football, Thomas, you do a lot of work as regards public speaking. And you recently even published a book on culture within the workplace and bringing joy into the workplace. Could you tell us a bit more about that? 
Yeah, first of all, I'll say the book is uh, only in Danish at the moment. Um, it's 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 called in in English it's called Lazy Energy with with the seven lazy principles, and it's a little bit like an ironic uh, book uh, about. Oh, it's not ironic, but you know, it, it's it, the, the seven lazy principles is set with a with a kind of humor. So some of the lazy principles are, are for example, let the others do the work, and it doesn't mean that that you shouldn't do anything yourself but it's all about getting help when you have a challenge for example um also party more that's the seven uh, seven laser principle that's all about celebrating remember to do that so so people have, have been you know a lot of companies especially in denmark have been hiring me speaking about that subject because sometimes people are just fed up with 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 uh, things like hard work you have to work harder and do more because sometimes hard work can kill you too so um so I use a lot of time uh, speaking with with um, with companies. Um, did a lot of speaking for, for example, Lego, Novo, Siemens, and things like that. So um, so I really enjoy that. I, I, I don't really have so much time as I used to uh, doing public speaking uh, because I'm throwing coaching and travel all around the world. But when I have the ch- uh, chance to to speak for companies, I, I really love it because, um, you know, my, my experience is not only from my book, but also from my sporting background in athletics, bobsledding, and, and now uh, football as a throwing coach can can uh, inspire and make, make a difference for companies too. So I love to do that. Superb. And then Thomas, for someone like yourself, who's achieved so much in sport and outside of sport, I mean, a lot of people would be you know, they would be quite content to just taking the foot off the pedal, so to speak. I mean, where do you get this abundance of motivation from? I'm, I'm just like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a creative person. I'm, I'm, of course, I do a lot of structure with my throwing coaching because I couldn't succeed if I didn't do that. But, but, but you know, from I'm a creative person type and I have a lot of ideas, uh, see myself also uh, as an innovative type too, and I have all these ideas. So, you know, I, I set all these goals and and I'm also thinking a lot of other things than, than football and sports. So, so no matter what I meet, I, I try to see if I can like reach something or get something out of my ideas and so 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 for me it's just about having a lot of fun um in life and 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 for me i'm i'm never i'm never satisfied i'm i'm not seeing myself as a perfectionist because i'm not at all but it's more like that the playfulness the creativity uh, leads me to to set a lot of uh, exciting goals and that's what i think is it's it's fun in life so um so i think no matter what what if i in the future i'm going to work in some uh, innovation area of a of a of a company or something else you know i'll i'll just try to set new goals cover it with people getting good relations and uh, giving value and so so i think that's what brings me to uh, new places in life so yeah and finally just to wrap up thomas i mean for someone out there be it at the start of their journey or right now in the middle of their journey following their passion be it a niche irrespective of whatever industry what advice would you have for them first of all say be kind to people because uh you you can sit uh, at your own office or in your own little room and be really really good but you'll never transfer your uh your ideas and into the world if, if you're not having good relations with people so be open-minded try to help people get help if you have a challenge because why why wait to to be better if there's a lot so much help out there i'll also say be kind to everyone you meet not only the the important people the famous people i try to get um you know a lot of uh, knowledge and and good relations to to all people around it could be people i meet on the street it could be a security guard and on on the football pitch when i'm training so be open-minded, be kind. And then I'll say if you are passionate for something, and I think all people have a passion for something, go really deep, go really deep. Be curious, try to find new angles and everything. So 
so I think that's that's all in all my my best piece of uh, advice to people. And then um, have patience. Um, you know, I've been working with throw-ins for many years now. I had four years in bobsledding. I had six years in in athletics. You'll never, you know, you're not you're not going from 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 scratch and then to fantastic in three weeks or six months. Keep on, keep on uh, digging into the stuff, learn new things. So, uh, yeah. Brilliant. Uh, Thomas, it's been absolutely inspiring to speak with you. Um, I've got a lot of value from this. I'm sure hopefully the listeners will too. Um, where's best for everybody to connect with you on social media? I'll say connect with me on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on Instagram. I also have a YouTube channel where people can uh, get some tips and tricks on throwing coaching. And then I also have, um, I have some free drills on my um, my homepage, thomasgronemark.com. Uh, it's my four best basic throwing drills. And already now there's been more than 4,000 coaches and, and, and players from all around the world who's been picking them up. So you can get them free. I'm getting a lot of good feedback. You can use these drills from all from U10, but also to pros. I'm using them for my pro teams too. So so go to thomasgronemark.com or thomasgronemark.com slash free, then you'll get them directly. So um, so yeah, say hello to me on, on social media, uh, then I'll be happy. Brilliant. Thomas, absolute privilege speaking with you today. Top man. Speak soon. Yeah, speak. Yeah, bye-bye, Connor. Bye.